Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar today. My name is Lindsay Goff. I am the digital marketing manager at People for Bikes. And today we are talking about the hot topic of inventory data. I'm really excited to bring this topic in for today. So to get us started, um, you know, we always do an icebreaker question. So in the chat, if you wouldn't mind dropping in, what piece of data are you most interested to learn about? And before we jump in, I would like to give a big sincere Thank you to our members. Um, we love you. You make our work possible and we're very, very grateful for you. And so now I'm going to introduce Patrick, our bicycle industry research manager on our team at People for Bikes, as well as Dirk Sorensen, the executive director uh, of the sports industry analyst at the NPD group. So we're very excited to jump in. Again, in the chat, we're dropping um, the piece of data that you're most interested to learn about. And with that, I will pass it off. Perfect, thank you, Lindsay. Um, hey everyone, I am Patrick Hogan. I am the Bicycle Industry Research Manager at People for Bikes, which means that I, see, I oversee all of our studies of participation, retail activity, and um, consumer insights, like this market research that uh, most of my work takes place on the coalition side, working with the Industry Trade Association. And then I also work on the foundation side with our advocacy 501c3 work. Um, but today we're just going to be talking about member benefits provided to coalition members in the form of NPD data. So briefly, the BPSA and now People for Bikes has provided coalition members with retail data from the NPD group uh, for years. And in March, about um, 10 weeks ago, we signed a new contract with NPD to provide an additional 36 months of data. Um, and as a part of that new contract, we now see inventory data, which as we all know, through the pandemic was um, a topic that was brought up a lot. And now we're excited to be able to offer inventory data to our coalition members. So in the short amount of time that we have today, we're going to describe what those data are, what they measure, um, how they can be used, and then quickly go over how to access those data. And then once you get there, an example of what we're seeing in those data and how you can efficiently uh, interpret those data to make better decisions for your company. And then at the end, we'll have about 10 minutes for Q&A. So we can go ahead and, yep, that's perfect. I'm gonna hand it over to Dirk. Yeah. So, um, you know, briefly what, um, you know, Patrick wanted me to do, and I think is really valuable is to talk about what this inventory data represents, what it's measuring and so forth. So really broadly, um, you really through your membership have access to two data sets that inform you of inventory. Um, the new data that is being provided comes through our sell through program and measures the inventory on hand at retail, uh, specialty IBD retail only, um, through kind of the sell through methodologies that we use here at NPD. So we collect data essentially from about 600, and 600 plus doors and then project that to a universe and this inventory data actually represents uh, what we're seeing at the end of the month as represented in the point of sale systems for those retailers. The categories that are included are um, everything that that IBD management is providing to us. So everything from apparel to accessories, parts, helmets, shoes and gloves and bicycles and all those subclasses and categories are, uh, and you can analyze any of those and you can dive into those in, in, in depth. One recommendation that you know, Patrick and I have of you is really look at the data from the meaningful lens of what your business is about. So if you're a helmet manufacturer, dive into that data as opposed to looking at like an aggregation of helmet, shoes and gloves. It's more representative the deeper you go in, in, into the data. 
So uh, the data is collected through point of sale systems and then is used, then we utilize here at NPD a projection methodology to make that inventory representative of the total market. So we take our sample and project it up and we typically um, have a, a basically a methodology that weighs the retail value or retailer's value based on brand mix and, and regional location. So all of those factors are, are kind of uh, impressed against the data to give something that's fairly representative of the marketplace. Um, a lot of people ask me questions around, well, why do you have the, the, the traditional old, now people for bikes sell in data as well as this, this sell through data that represents inventory and how are they the same or different? And I think really broadly, they're very they're very different methodologies, right? So one is self-reported in inventory from the manufacturing community for just bicycles. Um, that inventory data comes into us or in into People for Bikes at, at you know a different frequency or time period than the sell-through data, which is collected at the end of the month. So they are a little bit different. Yet when we look at them together, they do align over time. Now, within a given month, they might vary a bit, but over time, they tell the same story. And we're going to get into that with the dashboard preview with Patrick as to where the market's going and the challenges that the industry is facing right now. Both data sets, I think, fairly represents the, the, the battles that retailers are now having in securing inventory. Patrick, is that a fair kind of overview of the product and, and that is now available for the for the members i think so I think yeah sounds good to me so uh, i'll hand so it back to you if you want to do a little bit of a a, a a show and tell so so to speak let's do show and tell and i'm going to share my screen and i'll apologize now in case i drop out my internet um, just started acting funky so uh we will Cross that bridge when I come to it if I drop out. So quickly, I wanted to go over how to access these data. Uh, many of you probably receive our monthly reports through the People for Bikes email, um, which looks just like this. It has our uh, reporting in here. Usually there's a couple images and it describes what we're seeing in the data. And it also has a link to the Excel workbook dashboard. For those of you who don't receive this email, or if you receive the email and you can't find it one day, or maybe you deleted it, you can always access these NPD monthly reports through the People for Bikes member center. So you would access it through peopleforbikes.org slash login, email address, it gives the two-step verification, and then that sends you to our member center, which looks like this. You'll land at the top of the page, Scroll down past the Business Intelligence Hub, past all this great information. And then once you hit this banded image, you'll see monthly sales reports right here. That is where we have cataloged all of the monthly EPSA and People for Bikes sell through dashboards um, up through the most recent one. This is March 2021. So when you click on that, you can see the same PDF that you would have uh, received in the email got all the same information and the same downloadable Excel workbook. So let's switch now to that workbook, which opens up on this about page. It, it has some definitions um, for the data and it describes how you can use these data within your organization. And for those of you that have used this dashboard before, you're probably familiar with the summary table. This all looks the same as it has in years past. We have dollars, units, and average selling price um, for bikes, parts, accessories, and services. As a part of this new contract, we also added a tab here which features apparel data. Uh, really exciting. We're, we're glad to be able to offer this view of the soft goods market. But for now, we're going to skip over this to the fourth tab, which is inventory. So you'll notice that all of these categories here are the same categories which we're able to provide retail data for in that summary table. Here we're looking at inventory dollars and units 
just within that IBD channel. So again, IBD refers to um, the specialty retail for bicycles. Um, so there is no selector switch here like we have on the summary table to choose IBD or rest of market because all of these data are specific to the independent bike dealer. And within each of these categories, we have the ability to look at the class so we can get really down into the details here within gloves and look at glove liners, fingerless gloves, full finger gloves. There's a lot of really great detail in here, which tells a comprehensive story about what's happening in the market. And while looking at these numbers are super fun, I think one of the really powerful tools within this workbook is the next to last tab, the trend analyzer, which many of you have probably seen. It traditionally has just housed the dollar sales and unit sales graphs here. Now we have inventory dollars and inventory units for the category class and subclass segments identified in the slicers up top. So to set the stage for 2020, um, I think it's important to have a quick discussion on the supply chain and the events that happened in 2019 and 20 that led to the inventory situation we saw um, come spring 2020 and, and there on. Uh, we know that 2020, the bicycle industry is facing a few constraints. There were um, increased tariff rates and difficulty securing product from overseas. When it became, when folks started thinking that a recession was coming, a lot of experts in the industry took out the typical recession playbook and, and operated accordingly, which is assuming that discretionary spending on leisure activities would be curbed as um, unemployment raises and as, um, as spending declines. So a lot of orders were canceled. Um, shops were preparing for less spending at the retail level. And then when we started seeing booms here in March, April, and, and May, um, we realized that that was not the way that this recession was going to happen, that it was in fact a very different year for the bike industry and, and cycling offered a way for riders to get out of their home and offered a way to gather in a safe manner and, and maintain a healthy lifestyle, which is otherwise pretty difficult during the pandemic. And so all at once, the industry started trying to ramp up production, uh, which faced its own set of constraints. Factories overseas were challenged with uh, reduced hours, reduced staff. They were having to abide by social distancing guidelines and other similar COVID protocols that were limiting their ability to bring product to the market. Um, and, and also there's increased shipping costs, increased freight. So all of this created a landscape where it the industry did not have enough product at the beginning of 2020 to ride this wave. And then once we realized we needed to ramp up, our ability to ramp up production was limited. So looking at what starting to get into some of the um, inventories we saw in 2020, if we look at bicycles here, we can see First of all, sales boomed in late spring, early summer. We're seeing record numbers of bikes being sold. And we're seeing this huge hit to inventory units. Shops at the, at the retail level, independent bike dealers are facing shortages of bikes in the warehouse on the sales floors. Looking at bicycles like this in this aggregated manner starts to tell some of the story, but there's a great level of detail when you start getting into specific classes of bicycles. And I think that's going to, it, it is a much easier story to understand. If we look at bikes like children's bikes, you know, talking about the supply chain, there's, there's a much wider supply chain that children's bikes are able to take advantage of. There's many manufacturers out there. There's relatively fewer components which make up children's bikes. And the same can be said for lifestyle leisure. 
You see inventory units taking these big dips and then recovering in a relatively short time frame. Uh, within about six months or so, inventories are starting to, to rebound and starting to build back up to uh, 2020 levels and even, or 2019 levels, pardon me, um, and even surpass those previous year levels as suppliers are able to get those product to market. Other classes of bicycles, which require more complex components, uh, more components overall, and have relatively fewer manufacturers making those components, have a different trajectory. So if you look at road bikes, we see that once demand really started taking off and sales were booming, these inventories were hit and have not yet rebounded. There's only a handful of folks, uh, of suppliers providing these products. Um, the supply chain is much narrower and more competitive, but it's hard for road bikes and also mountain bikes here, you can start looking at, um, to rebound and realize those, those 2019, 2018 inventory levels. So that's a quick overview of bikes. There's so much detail in here. We can look at bike locks, which operated very differently in 2020, as many of these locks are sold to um, folks who are commuting or to students who are going to and from school. We saw that schools were closed and, and learning was moved into an online platform. Lock sales declined in 2020 and inventories were actually higher than in previous years. And then, of course, in 2021, as we prepared to return to school in the fall, we saw sales increase in inventory units return to expected levels. And then one last interesting category I wanted to look at, work stands. So let's repair and maintenance and work stands. If any of y'all tried to drop your bike off for service um, during the pandemic, you noticed that turnaround times were, were a little bit longer than normal. Um, I don't think my experience was unique. And we've, we've run a couple of independent studies for our business intelligence hub, which found that uh, cyclists who were attempting to get their bike serviced or repaired were facing wait times longer than normal at service departments. And so here during the pandemic, we saw the sale of work stands increase dramatically. Um, we responded with another survey to find that there were a lot of cyclists purchasing work stands and using YouTube as a way to supplement their, their knowledge and their ability to repair their own bikes. And this too is a category where there aren't a significant number of players in the field selling um, work stands at the IBD level. These inventory units have continued to decline since 2020 and still remain low as they're not yet able to, to rebound. So I, I was hoping to get through a bunch more, but it looks like we only have a couple minutes left before Q&A. Um, a, a quick note on the wholesale data shared in the selling program. Dirk mentioned that um, a lot of suppliers really feel like we should be able to compare units sold from suppliers into the IBD channel to units that are in inventories at the IBD level or sold through the IBD level. Um, the method of data collection and organization doesn't allow for this, but as we expand the cell in sample frame, we can minimize the gap between these two data sets um, if we are able to get more folks into that sample frame. So if you work for a supplier of complete bicycles and you're interested in um, helping bolster that cell in sample frame, I would love to get in touch with you so that we can find an effective way to to get more visibility into that wholesale market and get a more complete picture of exactly what's happening through that whole supply chain. Um, and one last note before I hand it back over to Lindsay, um, the, the real value in these data and the real power that um, the People for Bikes Research Program has all comes from iterating this feedback loop where we've offered this product to our, our coalition members and we want to know what you find useful, what you think uh, could be improved upon, and we can continue to work to add more value to your membership. Um, so please let us know if you are able to get into this tool and play around with it a little bit. Um, 
just how you like it, what you think could be improved, and, and ways that we can continue to work together to get more visibility here. Wonderful. Thank you, Patrick and Dirk as well. Um, really cool to see the updates in the member center and how um, our members are able to play with that information and use what they need. So we had a few questions already coming through the chat. Um, so I'm going to start there, but we are moving into a Q&A portion. I imagine we'll have several questions. So um, feel free to use the Q&A feature or drop them directly into the chat. So one of the ones that I saw come through from David. At the beginning of the call, you mentioned that we now have 36 months of data from NPD. What was that referring to? And do we have access to that historical data in the member center now? Great question. I'm gonna turn my camera back on because I think my internet has stabilized. Um, I was referring to our new contract with NPD is a three-year contract. So, so for the next 36 months worth of data, we'll be providing a dashboard which looks like this and contains inventory. To answer the, the similar question there, each report contains 36 months worth of data. So within this trend analyzer, which I was just doing, we saw the past 36 months of data, which you can also access by, there, there's a sheet in the back end of this. Um, you can unhide the analyzer raw, which contains the, the dollar and unit amounts, which feed into these um, dollar and unit sales graphs. If you had, if you wanted to calculate historic average selling price or something like that, um, each report contains 36 months of data. So this report is, let's see, April of 2018 through March of 2021. If we went back to that April 2018, you would have the previous however many years worth of data too. Um, so there's a wealth of historic data here. And if you have any trouble accessing it, feel free to reach out to me and I'm happy to hook you up with um, whatever resources we have. Great, thank you. Another one that came through um, near the beginning of the call from Wayne, um, I'm interested in what you're seeing for sell-in data for the second half of 2022 and first half of 2023. Ooh, that's a great question. Um, if I had a crystal ball, we would be having a very different webinar. <laughs> um, yeah, so so the question is, selling data trends for the second half. Yeah, there's no telling. Um, I mean, our what we're seeing now in inventory data and what we're seeing in import data is a supply chain which is increasingly being able to respond to the demands that exist now. Um, we're monitoring a number of trends out there related to um, bike demand and, and measuring some of these leading indicators which can point to either sustained high demand or maybe a cooling down and a ratcheting down of retail activity, uh, which we're trying to communicate as quickly as we can to our industry members so that we can all be as responsive as possible when it comes to the second half of 22 and the first half of 23. Um, but the short answer is that um, I'm not sure, but we're doing as much as we can to make sure we're prepared for it when it gets here. Dirk, you're, you're muted still. What I was going to say is, you know, you know, forecasting, as Patrick just kind of alluded to, is um, a bit of the holy grail. And if, if we really could do it, I think we'd be having a different webinar. That said, you know, the use of historic data and trends, I think does inform our knowledge of where the market can be and is going. And, you know, the more you can be in that data every month and looking at how this, the how we're emerging from and, and adjusting to the impacts of the pandemic, the better. Um, you know, the basic insight that Patrick pointed to, which is, the behavior of one kind of category of bicycle can be radically different than another and both and or parts and accessories right so the, the demand and supply inform one another and you really you know my recommendation is to look at the stuff you know pretty consistently great thank you and a follow-up to that question from tess um so not looking for a projection 
but what are the indicators you're going to be looking for that would show a decline in selling? Oh, well, that's a good question. So, so the leading indicators that I was referencing were specific to sell through and consumer demand, uh, which doesn't necessarily act in tandem with um, the wholesale market. I think a lot of what we're using as leading indicators for the selling market is just conversations with suppliers. Mm -hmm. um, that's an area where we're kind of data poor and, and it's tough to get uh, suppl suppliers to describe to us exactly what they're doing. And I don't know that um, we're in the position to really be surveying suppliers about their activities. Um, but as much as we can, we're, we're working with our supplier members to understand kind of how the whole market is reacting to the demand that we're seeing right now. Right. So, you know, for me, I read a, a, a lot on, on what is in, you know, available through People for Bikes, what's on online from trade publications, even quarterly reports from those publicly traded companies to become a little bit more aware of, of how each of those major manufacturers are reacting to the demands uh, of the marketplace to kind of inform the supply side understanding of what's happening in terms of consumption. I'm just looking at our own sell through data, you know, incessantly trying to figure out changes in consumption um, and what that means and just trying to marry up those two things. Great. Thank you. And then a, a question from Craig. Um, you join late, no worries. Uh, yes, we do have soft goods data now. So for helmets and apparel, um, Patrick or Dirk, would you like to talk a little bit more about that? What's available? I will not only talk about it, but I'll share my screen if I can hijack this, Lindsay. Yeah. Let's do this. So yes, within the summary table here, the second tab within the workbook, we have the helmet footwear gloves category, which contains helmet data. Currently, we have three categories or three subclasses of helmets, full face, accessories, and regular helmets. We're working to hopefully in the near future expand those categories to reflect more um, some of the terms that are used currently within the helmet market. Um, and then the apparel market is contained in the third tab and the fifth tab. We have dollars dollar sales, unit sales, and average selling prices in the summary table. And then the inventory for apparel is contained on this fifth tab. And this contains a bunch of data which we hadn't previously seen. We just started reporting this during March. And so I am still getting used to looking at some of these data. Um, there's a lot of really good stuff in here. And there's also a separate trend analyzer for, for apparel, is, it, is that correct? That's exactly right. Yeah, we have the same trend analyzer, which is produced for the bicycle market, uh, the bikes, parts, accessories, and, and service is produced for the apparel market. Awesome. And we've got a lot of really good questions coming through. Unfortunately, we're going to run out of time here. But before I, um, before I put emails up on the screen so you can follow up, I'd like to get to one more really quickly from Scott. Does the data that you're showing include backlog and sold units or only sold units? Mm, really good question. Um, real quick, I'm gonna answer the first little half of this question, which is um, what is the time frame for these data? So these data are 2018 through 2021 and we overlay months on top of each other. So it kind of looks like the graph ends in December, uh, but this purple trend line here shows 2021 compared to 2020 in the green, 19 in the red, and then 18 in the blue. Okay. And these represent, these here dollar sales, represent units and dollars that are sold through um, either the independent bike dealer is kind of the conversation that we've been having for this webinar, um, or the rest of market. So what we're not capturing is backlogs. Um, and what we're not capturing is a direct to consumer component. So anything that's purchased um, directly from a brand, uh, whether that's through their website or a brand owned store is not captured here. That's a super good question. Great. 
Thank you. And I'm going to go ahead and wrap up so that um, we can get you all out of here on time. But again, thank you so much. Um, really amazing questions coming through. Obviously, it's very hard to put this, uh, this information into a 30 minute format. Um, I saw a couple additional questions and I really would encourage you to reach out directly to Patrick and Dirk. Um, they're both very responsive and would love to help you out with that. And I saw, uh, sorry to interrupt. I saw a few questions about, you know, calculating measures and that sort of stuff. Feel, I'm sure Patrick can help you, but I'm, I'm, I stand at the ready to help you all out with those kinds of questions. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And that is our content for today. So have a wonderful day.